the last few days we've had a conference here called Fitly Framed. Um, Greater Grace pastors have come and joined us and other visitors have come and to be with us for a couple of days. Uh, Friday night we had a preacher fest, which was 10 preachers, five minutes each. And they, you know how preachers are, they go over. But anyway, uh, we, that was a beautiful night, and, um, and we, we have some folks with us. Pastor Bob left uh, to go back to Cincinnati. Uh, Pastor Moore went back to upstate New York just this morning after the early service. Uh, Pastor Harry Weiskopf and Pat have come from Chicago, and they, they're here with us this morning. Um, and Pastor B Barry and Veronica and Kendall are here from uh, Hungary, and Pasha and Ruthie, the Knights. Um, uh, so we're, we're, without mentioning everybody, but uh, if you want to be welcomed, if you, you fall in that category, you want to stand up, Pastor Jim and Elsie from uh, upstate New York. Good. Good. Anybody else you'd like to stand? We maybe overlooked you. Jerry here from York, Pennsylvania. Good. Great. Um, uh, we have our service tonight, and then uh, tomorrow is New Year's Eve, and we're here in the offices. And then at, in the evening, we have our. We have. Uh, if you'd like to eat together at 5:30 in the evening, um, there's a buffet down at the end of the, the plaza in our in our restaurant. And then the service starts at 8 o'clock uh, tomorrow evening uh, for our New Year's Eve service. And we're going to have uh, uh, messages, some skits, some music, special music, prayer for the sick, anointing with oil. And, and we'll be on our knees as we come into the year next year, 2000. What's the number? Wow, that number is huge. I just got used to writing 2012. It took me a, long, a whole year to figure, you know, to keep it. And here we are changing it. Okay. Um, our first speaker this morning, he's going to give an introduction, is Pastor Rhonda Lewis from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So welcome him. Thanks, Pastor. Good morning. It's great to have a big crowd like this and the internet and everything. This is awesome. <laughs> so, uh, it's just a privilege, <clears throat> excuse me, to be here today. And I believe God gave me something to share with you. So please pray with me. Lord, we just thank you for being here today and uh, just ask you again to touch this time here and in Pittsburgh and just be with all the people there too this morning, Lord. And Again, heal people, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> i tell you what, uh, yesterday I went to the wedding, and we've just had such a good time being here just this you know, whole week, uh, uh, weekend, and, and edify, just edify. And I began to think about the, the value of wholesome words, because I see here the product of, of, of words that have been in, in, invested in, in souls, in your souls, and in my soul. But I was thinking about you guys, because of what comes out of you, you know? And uh, so I just, it just got me thinking about how we can't minimize the value of, of, of our words and how they can either be for good or for ill. But mostly for good is what I've been thinking about. And it just, I uh, thought about this verse in uh, Proverbs uh, 25, 12, <clears throat> excuse me, 11. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. And just thinking about that word fitly spoken, I looked it up and, you know, it kind of means the people that have the right word at the right time. But it also has the uh, notion of uh, rolling along smoothly. 
And I thought about how that the Word of God uh, helps us roll along in life. Or that we'll be in a place where we get stuck and somebody will have this word that helps us get unstuck. You know, like stuck in guilt or stuck in um, worry or stuck in discouragement. And that just a word in season will come from somebody. God will send that word to them and uh, bring them, you know, into our heart to help us to, to roll along in life. And I thought about how the scripture says that by, uh, by grace we reign in life uh, by one Jesus Christ. And I thought, yeah, part of that is rolling too, you know, because of the words that we get from, uh, from the Lord and through, through the pastor and through the portions. And you know what's amazing about it is we go through things in life and we can't figure out why, why do I have to go through this? But isn't that really where we get tempered? Isn't that really where the, the word becomes flesh inside of us as we mix faith with it and just keep going? Even when it's like uh, unpalatable and difficult. Like Pastor Schaller was talking at the last service about sometimes things, we don't do this just because it's fun or easy, but we just do it because that's what we do. That's like we're just, we need God. It was like when Peter was challenged and the disciples, will you go away too? Well, where are we going to go? You have the words of eternal life, you know? I mean, maybe, is there another option? Maybe I'll take it, but I don't think so. You know, the words of eternal life kind of, kind of rank up there, you know? And, and, uh, and, and so like, uh, I, I, thinking about this too in, in Isaiah 54, and we know this verse, but this is so key to not just our life, but the ones that we meet, the people we associate with, even in our own home. And that's a lot of times where the, the rubber really meets the road, isn't it? Yeah, it's with our, our spouse, our kids. Uh, and it's this, and I'm going to close with this because I, I wanted to, I felt like God was leading me to preach the main message. No, I'm just kidding, Pastor. <laughs> <laughs> and I got rebuked. No, so. Uh, <laughs> in Isaiah, and you know this verse, um, but the one that comes after it, the Lord God hath given me the tongue of the learned, that I should know how to speak a word in season to him that is weary. He wakeneth morning by morning. He maketh my ear to hear as the learned. And then it says this, The Lord God hath opened mine ear, and I was not rebellious, neither turned away back. You know, it's like sometimes that word comes, and, and it's uh, maybe, oh, it, it hurts a little bit. You know, maybe I'm de deceived or uh, proud and, and uh, I'm, I'm being told to, to minister and I don't really want to. Like, I want to preserve my life here. I have a right to do that. But the word comes and it says, no, this is the word in this situation so that you can operate in divine uh, understanding and in wisdom and, and help that soul that's weary. You know, sometimes we want to take things personal. So-and-so offended me. They hurt me. And I'm going to build, I'm going to have a grudge against them. But then he opens our ear to, to not think like that, but to uh, respond in the way he does, in grace. Amen? So just recognizing, you know, like James says a lot about the tongue, and it's a, just a small member, and it's, it can do a lot of good, it can do a lot of damage. But I thank God we're in a place where we're learning how to operate to use it in the mind of God through grace. Amen. Thank you. Good word. Wasn't that a good word? That was great. Mm -hmm. Thank you, sir.
Beautiful. So tonight we'll have also some visitors sharing tonight as well. Wow, wasn't that a good word? Rolling along. My, we're, my conversation rolling, rolling along yeah, are, are like apples of gold in pictures of silver. Thank you. Good word. Are you ready to go here? Okay. How about uh, stand up, please, and um, turn to your neighbor for a moment, say Merry Christmas to you, <laughs> Happy New Year. Hey, how about if we just uh, say to our neighbor, we're rolling along, we're rolling along. Our conversation, rolling along. Edification, encouragement, rolling along. All right, so uh, two parts to our message today. Uh, the first one, um, I still don't know if I should start yet. Let's see. Are we ready to go? Oh, uh, wow. Let's see. Okay. All right. Are you saved? Yes? Okay. Uh, how many of you are filled with the Spirit? How many of you are not sure about it? <laughs> how many of you want to be? Okay. All right. Uh, the Psalm 70, 75, 78, Psalm 78 is where we're going to go. We're going to turn there, but first Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6, 7, and 8. All right, let's read it together. All right, ready? One, two, three. As you have, therefore, received Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him. Come on, verse 7. Rooted and built up in him. Come on, louder, come on. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith as you have been taught abounding therein with thanksgiving, abounding with thanksgiving. I, I, I would love it if young people would learn to praise God. I think it'd be amazing if old people, okay, raise your hands, okay, would learn to praise God, okay? Abounding in thanksgiving, verse 8, Beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. Where did the congregation go? Where did you go? Okay. Uh, what? Oh, we, didn't, we, we don't have it up there. We don't have it. We don't have a Bible in our hand. We don't, we, here we go. Ready? Rooted. Thank you. Verse 8. Beware. Lest any more man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Let's read it again and make it, uh, let's go again. Ready? Here, okay, verse 8. Verse, just verse 8. Ready? Beware. Hold it. Beware. <laughs> Beware. What does that mean? Watch out, warning sign, hold it, attention, Achtung. okay, hey, hold it, Fidyalem, <laughs> beware, 
What do we have to be aware of? Lest any man spoil you. What does this spoil mean? It's an old English word, very like stealing. Yeah, take the spoil, like to take it, to take away from you. May a man could take from you and steal from you what? Your faith. Do you realize uh, you could go to a psychiatrist with all kinds of doctor degrees? He could sit down with you and talk to you and explain to you medically, chemically, with, with the whole thing why you are prone to be a believer. And he'll say, the reason you're prone to be a believer is your environment, your background, your chemistry, your, bi your physiology, even because you eat a lot of pizza, you become a believer. They have many reasons and explanations, and I'm not against the medical field. I I'm standing here as an evidence that they, that they know what they're doing. Praise the Lord, I'm thankful. But when it comes to psychiatry and psychology, it is not a hard science, and there's a lot of philosophy in it, and it could be that somebody could talk you out of your faith. Verse 8, beware, lest any man take, uh, spoil you through philosophy. It's the only word in our New King. In our New Testament, where we have that word philosophy written that way in the Greek language, and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Okay, you may be seated. Uh, I want to go, you got that in your background, in your mind, and I'd like to share with you a diagram that we do here quite often, and it is our grace diagram, and um, it goes this way, stairs, that's what these are, stairs, a man going up a stairway to reach God, and the man, he's uh, going up in time, and he's making some progress in his religion, and we have uh, elements of the world, or we can say here for his behavior, we could say this, his behavior, uh, and he thinks in terms of right behavior. And we are very skillful at making up uh, and having ideas about how to please God. What should I do to please God? Can anybody give me one? Prayer, okay. If I pray, yes. Obey. Man, that, that, these are true. They're not necessarily, but in... <laughs> what, do we have a translation? <laughs> Praising him. Hallelujah, okay. Yeah, hallelujah. It's, uh, we have um, uh, church, reading my Bible, maybe, and that's amazing. And going to church, that's amazing. Uh, behaving, doing the right thing, maybe how I dress, how I, how I speak. There are many, many ideas that I have as a person. Uh, that I use in order to find favor with God. I'm looking to find favor with God. I want to please him. I want to honor him. I want to obey him. But there's a problem with this idea. When it's at the very foundation of my life, it actually isn't right. There's something missing in this uh, picture. And it is that I believe that in time, if I have the right behavior, I will uh, please him and gain favor. That God will love me, we, we could say, he will love me more. Or I will, um, he will I will find favor with God. And of course, uh, in, the, in the time when Jesus came, 
there were uh, Jewish religious people who very much believed this and lived this way. They fasted, they prayed, they dressed the right way, they said the right things. But in fact, in their hearts, where we really are living, there was an emptiness. And we have to say that as Christians. Unfortunately, as Christians, there are people that have the idea about their Christianity, which is, you know, how I dress, the length of my dress, my haircut, uh, maybe the fact that I don't go swimming in a public place, or um, the, the amount of prayer, or the amount of Bible that I know, or the amount of faith that I have. All of that is very, uh, very important, very telling regarding my life. But then I am so uh, empty, rebellious. We'll look at it in Psalm 78 in a minute. And Psalm 78 is an amazing psalm that I would like you to learn as a believer because it shows us how messed up we can be how rebellious, how angry, how unbelieving, how reactionary we can be as people, as believers. It's a great, great uh, message. And I hope I'm getting uh, the idea across to you here this morning. Um, There is a world of behavior. We can put here the virtues that Pastor Stan Collins mentioned yesterday morning that Ben Franklin had 13 virtues that he worked on as a man to become a better man. And yet uh, he found the one thing that he always found servicing again was his pride. You can be very studious, focused, disciplined, dedicated, sincere, and honest and true, and yet then also very empty very lonely, very proudful, and actually not spiritual at all. It's amazing how empty we can be as a believer and as a church. It's amazing how a church can be, in effect, just a behavior and some type of a program and some kind of a discipline, but there is not power. And this is uh, and knowledge that we're talking about today. Whoa, we're going to get there in a minute. Wow, this is amazing. Do you understand what I mean? Are you following it with me? This staircase, Martin Luther went to Rome as a monk, as a Catholic monk, and there were the stairs with the broken glass, and he went up on the stairs on broken glass, on his knees and hands, and at the top he found nothing. Emptiness, restlessness. He went back to Germany as a restless monk, and he just could not find, he could not find the peace and the satisfaction that he was looking for as a man very prone to this idea of law and behavior. And I love it. If you hang out with us, you kind of get miffed. What's going on? Because it seems there's something else in that we are not on each other's cases regarding our behaviors. We are much more inclined and interested in the, the love, the grace, the spirit, the motivation that comes from God himself. It's exciting. All right, so the other side of the picture is this grace picture. And we draw it this way. God sent us Christ. Wow. God gave us his son. Grace, how do we define it? I could never do anything more for God to love me more. I could never do anything less, anything that would cause God to love me less. 
Nothing I ever would do, Billy Graham, who served God, or any other man or woman of God that you know, you can just say, God loves Jesus Christ. God loves Jesus Christ perfectly, and that's how he loves me. And that love, nothing I would ever do could increase it, and nothing I could ever do would decrease it. That's how God loves you. He loves you and has poured out grace upon you. Is it a ladder? No, it isn't. It's a resurrection. It's just, it's just life, Christ's life. Christ was raised from the dead and we were raised with him. It's over. It already happened. We are seated in heavenly places even as we are seated in Baltimore. We at the same time are seated in heavenly places. It's over. We are resurrected. We have died. We've been raised. We are seated with him. It's over by the grace of God. What did you do to earn it? Nothing. How about the thief on the cross? His hands are nailed. Did he ever do anything when he believed in Jesus? Did he ever do anything with his hands? They were nailed. His feet nailed. Did he ever go to church? Ever get baptized? Did he ever do a good work? Did he ever take a little lady across the street? Did he ever give money, pull out of his pocket and give money to somebody? Nothing, 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 nothing. He did nothing, but he believed. And abundant grace was poured out upon that thief. And Jesus said, today, today, when you die today and I die today, I will be with you and you shall be with me in paradise. Grace of God. No works. Grace of God. Not only, verse 6, Colossians 2, as you have received Christ Jesus, as you have received him, so walk in him. That means stay on this side of our diagram here. If you have received him, so walk in him, in the grace. Don't go back over here to this. But grow in grace and knowledge. Grow in his nature, in his spirit. Grow in fellowship, rolling along in our spiritual conversation, is apples of gold. What is an apple? Fruit. What is gold? Deity. In the Bible, these words have application. Apple of gold is divine fruit. Pictures of silver. What is silver? Judas Iscariot was sold for 30 pieces of silver. It refers to the price of redemption. Pictures of silver means the frame is redemption and the fruit is divine, apples. And our speech is like this. It's like redemptive speech. It's divine fruit from the Spirit of God, the grace of God in the context of redemption. Now let's go to the bad stuff. You ready? Did you get built up at all on that? Did you hear a good message there? Is that good news? Grace, 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 grace be unto it. Oh, I, 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 just, I just am refreshed. I, I need it. I want to think about it. I'm edified with grace. What it means, never earning it, just given to you. Isn't that great? Beautiful. It's good. Isn't it beautiful? It's true. Grace, meaning... If God gives you, by grace, it just is a gift. That's the meaning of the word. It's a gift. And um, there, there is no, it's just a, a gift based on his nature. Now, here's a question. Why did God make the universe the way he did? Couldn't he have made it perfectly if he's a perfect engineer? If God is perfectly intelligent, infinitely intelligent, perfect in his nature, why couldn't he have made a universe that was perfect and would always be perfect and never stop being perfect? Wouldn't a perfect God make a perfect universe? The answer is, yes, he could have done it, but he had a desire 
to reveal not a perfect universe, but he wanted to reveal his perfect self. He wanted to reveal his nature, what the nature of grace. He wanted to reveal what forgiveness is. So he gave us free will. With free will, we have the possibility of a catastrophe, a calamity, the possibility of death, destruction, alienation, of hell, of separation, of deceit and blindness. We could say, Lord, we would prefer you had done it the other way. And the Lord said, well, I never really did ask you your opinion, did I? Who are we that we could be his counselors? Romans 11. How can the pot say to the potter, why have you made us this way? Romans 9. But it says, in his wisdom he decided this. In his own mind, in his own decision making. He, he Actually, decision making is an anthropopathism for attributing God uh, human attributes when actually there was really no decision. It was simply reality. And the reality is unfolding, and in that reality, we discover grace. It is his pleasure for us to understand grace. It affects us relationally. Here's a simple, we've said it many times. I took my little girl, Bethany, she's 34 years old now, so she was about this tall, two years old, on the top of the car, and I stood there and said, jump, and she hesitated, and then she did, and then I put her back on the car, and, you know, soon she's just, just jumping all, just, I'm, a lot, I'm a lot enjoying it, and she's like laughing and enjoying it. That's a little picture of what it is that is happening today with you and God. God enjoys you jumping in his arms and trusting him. And he puts you back on the car, and he enjoys putting you on the car, and then standing there and saying, do you trust me? And we say, yeah, and then uh, we jump and have pleasure in the relationship. The relationship is what the universe is all about. Not the perfection, but the relationship. The perfection, God's got that down. He's perfect. But the world he made, and you and I are not. And what is needed to know, what we need to know is not so much about us, as much as we need to know regarding him, that we can trust him, walk with him, and be part of the world that he made his way. Okay? So now go to Psalm 78, please. <clears throat> Psalm 78 ministers a lot to me because it's a disaster psalm. It's a psalm that where you just see these people as um, unbelieving and rebellious. Verse 7 of 78. They might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. It might not be as their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation. A generation that set not their heart aright and whose spirit was not steadfast with God. Verse 17. And they sinned yet more against him by provoking the Most High in the wilderness. And they tempted God in their heart by asking meat for their lust. The psalm goes like this. God does this, the people are there, and they don't believe. Or they turn back in the day of battle. They, they, they said, verse 19, can God furnish a table in the wilderness? Verse 22, because they believed not in God and trusted not in his salvation. I, I, I like this psalm because 
It just puts it out there on the table where I am at and where I have seen people that have been careless in their relationship with God and also their relationship with the church. They say things like, well, I don't go there anymore. Okay, why, why, don't, you, why don't you come? And then, I don't know. I just don't go there anymore. Well, the question that comes to my mind is, are you, you're saved. I believe that you're saved. You're a believer. You're saved. You have the Holy Spirit. And so this is the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Yeah, but I don't feel so good. Okay? I, when I go to the church, it doesn't touch me. Or nothing's happening. Actually, it's kind of boring. I met, I've met folks like that over the years. It's kind of boring. I, nothing's really going on. I don't know what is really happening. And, and what do we say to that? We understand that. It's like people in America today, sometimes they go to a Christian concert, and this is what they go for. I want to have a good time. I want to go to the Christian concert, and I want to have a good time. I wouldn't say everybody, but some. But, but I have to ask the question, is our Christian faith about a good time? You can have a good time. I'm not against a good time. But what about this? I go because I want to meet God. I go to the church because I want to meet God. You know, if, if after the meeting everybody has a big smile and they, get, they, all go, and they all go home with a lot and they just have a big, they had a good time, I got to ask myself the question, is that a good meeting? It might be if that's from the Holy Spirit, but what if it is only emotion? What if it is a bit empty? What if it is only like uh, we did entertainment? What about this? I went to the church and I left and I was upset. And I, God touched my life and he told me to get right and get, get myself rooted and grounded. Lest beware, lest any man deceive you, lead you astray by philosophy and the rudiments of the world. In the Greek word there, stokia, the elements like in the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, the elements of the chemistry, chemical table, you know, sulfur, carbon, and so on. The elements in a series that are in the world. That's how I'm led astray. My stomach is more important than God. How about this one? I've seen men come to church with their girlfriend, and the girl, he gets saved, the girlfriend doesn't. The other way around, the girlfriend gets saved, he doesn't. And I'm sure, out in the car, when they drive home, there's a pretty hot conversation. What are you doing? What do you believe? I don't believe. I don't want to go back there again. Well, I, in any heart, I want to go back there. But I've got a choice. My girlfriend or God. And it may not be so clear at that moment, but that's what it is. Wow. How many church, get rid of the girlfriend. I mean, pray for the girlfriend to find her place. You know, we don't throw people away. He doesn't mean that, Rodney. You, you put words in my mouth, Rodney. <laughs> he didn't mean that. He may let, pray that she finds her place and, and, and ends up with a guy that's the person for her because I may not be that guy. Guys, I'm, I'm going somewhere now. I'm making a decision. But Psalm 78 shows us how fickle we are, how messed up. Let's read a couple more. Verse 32. For all this they sinned still and believed not for his wonderful, wondrous works. They saw the work of God and they still didn't believe. They have seen the work of God, but they said, no, thank you. 
They saw the work of God, but they said, it's not the way I thought it was going to be. I don't know about this. It's not the way I thought it was going to be. I don't know, you know, it's, I'm not as happy as I used to be. Well, before you were a happy fool, now you're a sad saint. <laughs> and if you get, if you may be a sad saint, maybe that sadness is good for you to get rooted and grounded. And believe me, your joy will be unspeakable and full of glory. Honestly, honest to God, God knows. I did not bring you out of Egypt to destroy you. But when you came out of Egypt, you said, huh? What? I don't, want, I don't think I want to be here. I want to go back to Egypt where there are melons and onions and le leeks and uh, other quality foods. Yeah, it is good. Wow. But then they sought him, verse 34. And when they slew them, then they sought him. They returned and inquired early after God. Now they come back. Wow, we've seen that happen. I've done it. You've done it. You, you weren't so happy about things. Your Christian life, you come to a service and maybe, you know, you just don't, you don't really know so much what's going on. You have a mood or maybe even something chemically going on in your body. You may even have a depression of some kind. But God says, forsake not the assembly. God says, draw near unto me. God says, I visit you in the assembly, in the body where we drink the same spirit. God says, be patient, be quiet. In quietness and assurance will be your strength. I will show you the effect of righteousness is peace. You have peace in your heart. And in your mind, it's true. I'm saying this to say, I don't always like it. It doesn't always push my buttons. It's not always the thing I'm looking for. And the Lord goes, good, come on. Wait, this is about me. And we say, Lord, um, really? And he goes, yep. I'm in the quiet back row. I am there. Yep, I'm with you on that lonely Friday night. I am. Yep, I'm, you, I'm with you when you make those good decisions. Yep, and I know how frail you are. If I said, God said, boo, you go, ah! <laughs> if, God, yeah, if God looked at us funny, we'd just collapse on the ground. You know what I'm saying? Like we do with each other. One phone call and I'm on the floor. I am so frail. I am so weak. I am so fickle. I am so undecided. I am so easily persuaded. Somebody can come along and mislead me and take me right across the street. Take me right away and they can easily mislead me by a simple conversation or a suggestion. Look at how many mighty men have fallen because of Beautiful women. Wow. How frail people are. A disappointment. Uh, a relationship. I don't go there because I don't fit in. Are you sure? Maybe you don't fit in because, you know, like, I could always fit in in the party. I could lead the group, I could have people around me in the party because that's the kind of guy I am or girl I am or I'm a quiet one and I, and I just don't feel like I can have my own friends my way but here I don't fit in. And maybe God says to us, that's good. So you can decide in your heart what you're looking for. Guys, if you go, you're looking for a birthday party, you can go find one or a group of people to yuck it up. And it'll be as shallow and as hollow as a tin can. But if you follow me, if you trust me, if you show up by faith, if you seek me, you shall find me and there shall be some depth 
in you. You get rooted and grounded, and not like these people in Psalm 78 who just said, I don't like it here anymore. I want to go back to Egypt. And also, who is God anyway? Come on. Who is God anyway? Who really knows what's going on? And they limited the Holy One of Israel. They tempted the Holy One of Israel. And God is saying, I will deal with you according to the skillfulness of my own hands. I will lead you. And he fed them according to the integrity of his heart, guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. And that what that means is, he understands us. Verse 37. Their heart was not right with him. No kidding. Their heart was not right with him. No kidding. Their heart was not right. Was that the problem? Yeah. I thought it was a parking lot. They said it was a parking lot. They said it was a parking lot. That's why they didn't come to the church anymore, because of the parking lot. Oh, really? Was it the parking lot that could keep me away? Or what was the color of the curtains? There aren't any, are there? Hey, the carpet, I don't know. What it was, the pastor was too loud. He was too quiet. He was such a nice guy. It couldn't be for real. He, he actually isn't such a nice guy. I mean, what was it? Yeah. And here it says, their heart was not right with him. I believe if my heart is right with him, we will be able to sense what he's doing and be part of it. They were not steadfast in his covenant. But here is the last part. But he, being full of compassion, thank you, Lord, he forgave their iniquity. God, I was such a dumb idiot, and I still am. I am such a, I'm filled with this chemicals, hormones, neur neurons, trillions of connections in our brain. It's a marvel any of us are here today. It's a marvel that we're able to speak and listen. It's amazing that in our heart there is love and faith and grace. It is amazing that we love ourselves and accept ourselves as we are. God, you are good to us. And he goes, I am. I'm really good. I have compassion on you idiots. <laughs> and I mean that. Jesus is like rolling his eyes back. It's not in the Bible saying that, but I'm saying it by way, oh, you know, it's like, you know, Father. It's like, the, you know, well, how, Mark 8, how is it you don't understand? John 14, Philip, have I been with you and you don't know me? <laughs> yeah, Lord. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's worse than that, Lord. Not only I don't know who you are, I don't even want to be here. It's worse than that. I got plans to get out of here. Judas had a, a rap with me the other night at the coffee shop, and he says some very convincing things. I think I got one foot out of the group. I'm out of here. And the Lord is rolling back. And, These are the mighty ones. These are the apostles. There'll be statues and cathedrals in their names. And hold denominations with their teaching. Hey, I want you to get used to this. I want you to understand what we're saying. I don't want you to trust in yourselves. I want you to know that we that are here as pastors and leaders are the same as you. But we have decided that if God could, by his grace, save me, he has a plan for me. And as I have received him, I want to walk in it. Walk in the same grace and beware. Beware lest any man spoil you and take away from you the treasure that you have in your heart. Your faith, your words, your wisdom, your ministry, your calling, your direction. Lest anybody take away from you that which we protect and guard in a sacred way by giving us and by God giving us these kind of messages. To sit where you are and say, I understand that feeling. 
I know what it's like to leave. I know what it is to take off. I know what it's like to be lost. I know what it is to be confused. I know what it is to be empty. I know what it is to get up in the morning and feel like I got hit by a sledgehammer, spiritually speaking. I know what it is. But I also know the other side of the story. David's side. I run through a troop, leap over a wall. We do valiantly with God. God is with us. But not always. Let me finish with this. Noah built an ark. What's, what do we say? Whoa! Noah built an ark. Man! Where'd you get that? Off the internet? Where, huh, you built an ark? Yeah, I did. How about your whole life? Well, at the end, there were only a handful of people on the whole earth. I got kind of lonely. I would have gone to a pub, but there wasn't any. I planted a vineyard. I made wine, and I got drunk. You mean you started so well, you are such a great man, and then you ended, you ended up drinking to get drunk? Yeah, I did. Thanks for telling us this story and the many other stories like it. David, what about you? Surely you started. You're the man with a heart after God, a man after God's own heart. Yes, I am, but not always. You know the story. David, I wish I, you had finished well. I wish you did finish well, but I wish you'd gone all the way, all the time. It didn't happen. It doesn't. We're not perfect. If you're to planning to uh, climb the ladder, have a good time. Climb your ladder. At the end of it, there isn't any end. You always owe more. And in the process, you find yourself absolutely feeling at times like a hypocrite, empty, and nobody knows it, lonely, and you don't let anybody see it. And, and, and needy, and we're saying, uh, one woman was in our church here, 30 years, went to services, paid her tithes, sent her kids to the day school, and after 30 years, she said, I'm finished. I, I am married, and I'm not happy. I live in a house, I don't like it. Uh, my kids, I'm not satisfied with what's happened to them. And I'm finished. Now, what's the answer to, in my heart? Who were you following? What were you following? What, was this your plan, your, your equation for a successful, happy? You thought after you go to church and read your Bible and say your prayers and send your kids to school, that at the end of the story, you're going to live in the house you love, the man you love? And be so filled and satisfied with all of the good things that have happened in your life. Yeah, that's what I heard. That's what I believed. And I, I, I'd like to say to her today, yeah, that's not our message. Nobody has a handle on this. This is about God. God is bigger than us, bigger than our plans, bigger than our own lives. And we are very prone to like react and say, ah, you know, you let me down. I'm in this wilderness. You let me down. And you've done this and that, but you didn't give me what I wanted. And the Lord said, yeah, that's right. And when you grow up, come to me. Or when you get hungry, lonely, empty, come to me. Because I'm the God of grace. I'm the one that will fill and satisfy. Verse 39. For he remembered that they were but flesh. Thanks, Lord. That lady I just mentioned, she's got a chance. She's still she's alive. I, I think so. I don't know. And I care about her. And I think that she's made, made, made a major miscalculation. But we all do. We all make miscalculations. But he remembered that they were but flesh, a wind that passes away and comes not again. How oft they did provoke him in the wilderness and grieve him 
in the desert. Yea, they turned back and tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. And I, I this uh, word today isn't the end of the story. It's only one application, but I hope it's useful for you. Now, I just to say it very clearly, God has a plan. God has a place for you. We are so prone to disagree, react, say in our flesh these things. But he is so kind, so compassionate, and he says, okay, once you blow your steam off, why don't you kind of get a grip? Why don't you kind of realize, come to me and get me. I am here for the getting. Come to me. I am God. I want to fill you and satisfy you. Come to me and learn of me. I am meek and lowly. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Come, come to me and put all your trust in me. Ask Caleb and Joshua and get, put all your trust in me and you'll not be ashamed. Honestly, he's saying, come on. I am the one. And I know you're prone to be crazy, you know, fickle, uh, um, combative, misunderstanding, reactionary. I, I, I'm reading about the brain, and I've read that as you get older, the frontal lobe, that thinking processes, they kind of, uh, they are not as sharp as they used to. You may also be prone to emotional reaction like old grumpy people. And I would say, that's me, and Lord, you know, you got to have a lot of compassion on me. you got to equip me and help me. But I know that that's what you do, and that is who you are, and this is who we are. We are not only flesh and blood, but we are spirit. We're not only people with real hurt feelings, but we're also spirit-filled people. Very kind of tough, like we're able to take it. Nobody talks to me, it's okay. I will talk to them prayerfully in love. I don't fit in, that's okay. God fits me in. God puts me where he wants me to be. I'll show up, I'll own it. I'll, at my church, I'll own it. Somebody, somebody goes like this, I'll go to the church, if it makes me feel good and I like it, I'll come. But when that's over, I'm gone. And we say, think of it this way. Come to the Lord and hear from him. What does he have you to do? And have not a good time, but a godly time in God. And show up and own it. We need people that are owning what it is that God has given you. God has given you new life. You own it. You take a hold of it. God has called you in a, in a mission, in a, in a work of God, in a, in a work in the end days. And I own it. And I'm not light, blown with the wind. We're rooted and grounded. We're kind of heavyweights. Guys, we are, we are not easily moved by our own emotion, by the times that we live in and the noise that is out there. But we're solid people with solid thinking and a solid relationship and a living God that says, grow in my grace and I'll lead you and use you. These are disciples. Believers in the end times because of his word. Last one, 57. But they turned back and dealt unfaithfully like their fathers. They were turned aside like a deceitful bow. They turned back. I got a uniform on. How about this? A little boy playing football. He's got his helmet on and his little uniform and everything. And he shows up at the sideline. And the coach says, go, Eddie, go on in. <laughs> I'm, not going, I'm not going in. Eddie, go ahead, go ahead, get in there, go ahead. You're trained for this. <laughs> not going. <laughs> How about that? That's it. Hey, the Lord is saying, no, I need you in the game. Come on. Yeah, I might get hurt. Yeah, probably you will. But get in there. We're with you. This is what you train for. That's the kind of church that we go to. This is the kind of Bible that we read. 
Not only have you received Christ Jesus, but you got a hold of it. He, he's real for you. You show up. And the Lord is saying, you got the uniform, I got the training, now and I need to get you in the battle. They turn back in the day of battle. MK, I mean, uh, AK 40s, I mean, M16, the uniform, everything, the goggles, the whole hearing aid, the whole thing, of packs of ammunition, they're ready. And it's like, eh, I'm out of here. Not going to happen. I'm not going out there. Not going to do it. And God is saying, come on. If you go into the promised land, I need you to go into the promised land. I need you to show up. I need you to be there, rain or shine, whatever happens, show up. I need you to be a hearer. I need you to believe me. I need you to live beyond yourself. I want you to know that I'm the God of all grace, and I'm going to get it done. And I'm going to use crazy people with trillions of neuron connections, with hormones, and if I don't have my lunch, I collapse. And, and weaknesses of all kinds. And somebody says, I don't like you. I go, what? You don't like me? <gasps> Two days I'm depressed in the apartment. He said he doesn't like me. <laughs> it's like, get used to it. Come on. Hey, come on. We got to get beyond ourselves and get in tune what is really valuable, really happening. Jesus did it. He's our example. And you and I are on a road to make an impact in the city of Baltimore, state of Maryland. Yes, in Washington, D.C., we're coming at you. And yes, in Montana and Utah and California and into all the world. And it's not a question. We're just saying, of course, with a lot of joy, what could be greater? And for a young man or a young woman to learn how to think with God, what could be greater than to grow in that grace? What could be greater than the wisdom that comes from God to go into a man or a woman's heart? What could be greater? Thank you, Lord, for that. And help us. <clears throat> Amen. Tomorrow night is our New Year's service, and as we said earlier, and we'll pray for that. And amen, Albert. Amen. Thank you. Yes. Would you pray with me, please? If you're here today and you don't have Jesus in your life, don't go another hour without him. You need him. Please come to Jesus. I, I, I mean... Bad people, come to Jesus, please. The good people, you come to Jesus, please. You must come. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. Say that prayer, please. Lord Jesus, I believe in you. If you say that prayer in your heart, you're born again. You're a child of God, according to the scripture. Raise your hand, please, if you're saying that prayer. <clears throat> anyone at all? Raise your hand. Over here, anyone? Raise your hand. <laughs> Father, we pray that uh, this year, 2013, we'll see people come and get rooted and grounded and founded, established in the faith. Thank you for this congregation and these thoughts. Amen.